Hello, fictional. Welcome to the What If Issei. Today we are gonna see, What If Issei Got Harem With Sona. Part 7. If you end up liking this video, please consider subscribe, so without further ado, let's get into the video. Sona's eyes were fixed on the display. She held Issei's uniform blazer in her lap and clutched it almost like a child would clutch a security blanket. A hand touched her shoulder and she started, jerking around to glare at whoever dared touch her. She relaxed as she saw Tsubasa. The rook's expression was equally intent, with a brittle calm, and her azure eyes were fixed on the match too. Sona felt a spike of chagrin, for having forgotten that she wasn't the only one whose heart was in her throat at this very moment. A moment later, she realized that Aika and Ria were also watching intently. The bishop's hands were twisting and crumpling the pleats of her skirt, while the pawn was playing idly with one braid. Well, it might have started as idly. By now, she had actually unraveled the braid without realizing it. The resulting look was surprisingly fetching. Sona waved them over, turning her attention back to the match. After a moment, she felt two more hands resting on her shoulders and closed her eyes. It was strangely soothing. Oh, Ikun, she heard Ria whisper. Indeed, she agreed. Go, Issei Kun. Incompetence. Riser thundered. He stormed back and forth in the office, his phoenix fire surrounding him like an aura. From time to time, he would snatch something off the table or desk and hurl it at the wall. Ravel found the demonstration more reminiscent of a toddler throwing a tantrum than something actually threatening, but she knew she was in a relatively privileged position. The rest of her brother's peerage wasn't, and the ones who weren't outright cringing away had subtly scooted back. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw Isabella and Mihi subtly orienting on each other, as if to come to each other's rescue if needed. Riser, she knew, was too self-absorbed to have noticed their relationship, and she had no intention of informing him. After all, it was increasingly likely that his ego would probably not tolerate them loving anyone but him, and they would probably suffer for it. Riser whirled and pinned Ravel with a glare. You. Take the rest and occupy this zone. He stabbed his finger down at the map, indicating the most direct route between the two bases. Since Ria's rabble took out the incompetence, they're probably feeling all high and mighty. They'll think they can sweep in and take us quickly. Disabuse them of the notion. Ravel looked stonily at him for a long moment, wondering if he knew how he sounded. Finally, she shrugged. A frontal confrontation. Riser sneered. If you want to fancy it up, go ahead. What they've accomplished comes more from you Baluna's failure than from whatever talents they may have. I'm sure you can handle whatever they want to throw at you. Very well. Ravel looked at Isabella. Isabella Sand, please take Mihi San and Sirison and conceal yourself along their approach before circling around to seal off their retreat. Isabella nodded. Yes, Ravel Sama. Her eyes shifted towards Mihi and Carloman, and the three of them left the office quickly. Carloman San, Nai San, Lee San, please come with me, she continued. We'll meet them head on and hit them at the same time as the others. Agreed, Ravel Sama, the knight said firmly. The pawns grinned, clearly spoiling for a fight. Ravel smiled thinly and led them from the room. At least this would make what she had planned easier to carry out. She didn't particularly care how Riser felt about it, but she'd rather not see her peerage mate suffer. They're being subtler than I expected, Asia reported. She was using a perception enhancement spell and was observing the far end of the approach to Riser's base. That may be Ravel San at work. I only see her, one of the knights, and the two remaining pawns. Yes, I suppose Riser would be using her as his second in command with Ubaluna down, Ria's mused. The communication circles had been switched to conference call mode, the better to coordinate the next stage. That's still his other bishop, knight, and rook missing. There's no sign of them. None, Asia replied. The spell I'm using is tuned for magical detection, so I'd be able to tell if they were using a cloaking spell. Thank you, the Grimory era said, and was silent for a long moment as she thought. Finally, she asked, any thoughts? At a guess, I'm pretty sure Riser's expecting us to take the obvious passage and be surprised by an interception, Akeno posited. The missing pieces are probably Ravel's idea to try and pincer us. Not too bad there was a smile in her queen's voice. It'd be a shame to disappoint them. It's the most direct route, but there are a few others, Issei pointed out. It depends on how patient you want to be, senpai. Ria's considered that. You're right, but it's his patience I'm worried about. We need to avoid him reacting unpredictably, at least for as long as we can. She made a soft thoughtful sound. It looks like we're in a good position for stand. I can't believe you went with that name, Issei snorted in Ryan amusement. He didn't disagree, though. They had kicked around the idea of letting a detachment draw out his remaining pieces and having Ria's magicians namely, Asia and Akeno, take them out in a ranged attack. It wasn't something that they'd counted on, but they'd trained for it, and so far they were in a position that exceeded their most optimistic projections. 
Issei wasn't particularly happy about being the decoy force, but that was status quo for a rook, and it was one giant step closer to shutting down Riser. You're the one who suggested it, she teased him good-naturedly. Do you concur? Yeah, I think so, Issei replied. This is about the best case scenario for it. Agreed. Akeno was completely free of doubts. Haidu kun, Yudo kun, Kaneko chan, you've probably already guessed, but you'll be the detached force. Do everything you can to avoid acting before all of his remaining peerage have revealed themselves, but your well being is paramount. If you feel you need to engage, she trailed off, but the implication was clear. Yes, but you, Kiba and Kaneko chorused, and Issei nodded before adding, Yes, senpai. Saji kun, I want you and Mireyama sent to wait until they're engaged before making your way to Riser's base by one of the other routes. If necessary, Saji kun, go ahead and promote. Once you're there, take cover and wait for the others to catch up. Yes, senpai, the pawn and knight chorused. Asia, Akeno, you know your roles. Get ready. Ria smiled. She knew they couldn't see it, but she hoped they heard it in her voice. I'm very proud of you, everyone. You've done so well today. I just need a little more. She let the prey sink in, and then, in her king's voice, ordered, move out. Right. Her peerage, both permanent members and temporary ones, said in unison. It was a fine line to walk, Issei thought. They had to make it clear that they were taking the most obvious route. At the same time, though, they couldn't be too obvious about it. Riser might have his head up his ass, but there was altogether too good a chance that Ravel would sense something was up. And so the three of them had to move furtively down through the schoolyard, darting from notional cover to cover, putting on the airs of a group trying desperately to reach their objective, before fortune caught up with them. As a result, it was nearly a relief when they were pincered. Truth be told, his patience was starting to fray, especially without Kaori's soothing presence. The group led by Ravel was waiting at the approach to Riser's base. The Phoenix daughter herself wore a solemn, determined expression, and Issei wasn't really sure what she thought about the whole situation. He knew that she was at least opposed to the part that involved him getting killed, which was good. The rest of it, though. He heard Kiba draw in a slow breath behind him, and the soft sound of subtly muffled footsteps. That would be the second group, the ones intended to seal off their retreat. The brown-haired knight stepped forward, declaring, my name is. Parliament San, Issei interrupted, his tone sharp. I know who all of you are. I'm afraid I don't particularly care right now. Get out of our way. He knew his response wasn't particularly polite, but to hell with it, it wasn't their lives on the line, after all now. He tensed, and two bundles of roofing nails broke loose from his bandoliers and started rotating around his hands, while electrokinesis skipped up and down his forearms. Harleman looked especially stunned by Issei's curt response. Her mouth opened and closed several times as she tried to find a proper response. Normally, I would apologize for my friend's attitude, Kiba said gravely. But under the circumstances, I think he has good reason to be irritable. I know, Isabella said, stepping into Issei's line of sight. Her tone was genuinely apologetic. Issei san, I'm sorry. If I had any control over this. I don't blame you, Isabella san, Issei said tersely, forcing himself back to politeness. Isabella deserved that much, at least. Any of you. Just your asshole of a master. So I'll give you all one chance to walk away now. After that, I won't hold back. Azure flames suddenly cloaked him like an overcoat, enough so that his friends winced and pulled slightly away from him. Isabella winced as well, taking a step back. She shook her head, opening her mouth to respectfully decline. I walk away. All eyes shifted to Ravel, who wore a solemn expression. More than that, she looked as though she'd already decided to do this before Issei had even made the offer. She spoke slowly and clearly, as if her words were being broadcast across the underworld. Which, for all Issei really knew, might actually be the case. Ani-sama is being a fool and placing the house at risk. I won't support him in that any longer. Easy for you to say, Ravel-sama. Cyrus protested. You have options. But the rest of us are obligated to follow riser samas orders. I plan to ask Akasama to trade for me, Ravel explained. Any of you who wish me to ask the same on your behalf, I will. But as for this match, I wash my hands of it. Infused silence rang in the air. It was finally broken by Mihi clearing her throat. I think I agree, she said diffidently. Ravel Sama, I request your help in that regard. You'll have it, Ravel said, nodding firmly. Mihi. Isabella said in dismay, and Issei was a little surprised at how much dismay she managed to pack into that one word. I'm sorry, Isabella, but Ravel Sama is right, the bishop said softly. A look passed between the two of them, and Issei suddenly realized what kind of relationship they had. Riser Sama is not acting honorably, and he doesn't seem to care how it affects those around him. This is all I can do. She held out a hand to the rook. Please. Come with me. Isabella looked tormented for a long moment. 
Finally, she closed her eyes and shook her head. I'm sorry, she half whispered. I gave my word. I know, Mihi replied, her expression at once solemn and sympathetic. As do I, Ravel agreed. Her gaze swept her peerage mates. My offer still stands. If you're interested, speak to me later. She cleared her throat. I surrender. The teleportation spell kicked in, and she disappeared. I surrender, Mihi added, her voice now firm. She was swept from the game field in a wash of light particles. Phoenix Bishop, retired. Phoenix Bishop, retired. Grafia's voice was openly stunned. Issei couldn't blame her. Anyone else? He said aloud, trying to keep his voice level. Well. That was unexpected, Akeno murmured over the conference call. She hovered 50 meters above her comrades and the opponent surrounding them. Do we still want to proceed with stand? Wait and see if anyone else follows Ravelchan's lead, Ria's advised. I have to say, I'm surprised too. I guess Haidu Kun really impressed her in Kyoto. I don't think she really realizes how much, yet, Akeno said blithely. Standing by on my end. Asia Chan. I believe I have my targets lined up, Asia reported. Standing by as well. Screw this guy, Sira said, snorting. If Riser Sama wants him dead, I'll be happy to oblige. She started to lunge at Issei, then staggered backwards, stunned as an arrow wrought from distorted air struck her heart in the breed biscuit, knocking her to the ground with enough concussive force to put her lights out. The next night, retired, Grafia reported. Her peerage mate stared in surprise. As they started to react, another arrow, equally insubstantial, arsed high into the air and split into four, raining down and striking each of Riser's remaining servants. Unlike the one that had taken out Cirrus, these did nothing other than pulse a faint reddish-white, not unlike some kind of signal beacon or targeting device for artillery. From her expression, Isabella was the first to parse the similarity. Scatter. She yelled. Find the mage who fired those arrows. She turned towards Issei, eyes narrowed, and threw herself at him, clearly intending to get inside his range before he could fire. Even as she did that, though, and even as her peerage mate started to scatter, Akeno's lightning began to fall. She was using her standard electrokinesis for this, they had long since agreed that her holy lightning needed to be saved, as much as possible, for Riser. But she was boosting her normal attacks as much as possible, with the help of Storm Dancer. Parliament was the first to go down, her mind still apparently stalled by her opponent's refusal of fair play. The lightning took her out before she could even scream. The next night, retired, Grafia's voice rang out. Nye and Lee were next, but they didn't go out alone. The two of them dodged Akeno's first strike, exchanging glances, and then charged at Issei, who immediately backpedaled. Akeno was walking her lightning up and down the field, trying to be mindful of her teammates while pressing her enemies. This resulted in both Issei and the twins having to dodge both her lightning and each other, neither able to land a telling blow. In the end, the contest was decided by Kiba, who met their demonic energy charged fists with Holy Eraser's blade. The Sacred Gear's blade wavered but held, and Kiba quirked a quick smile at Issei. I have them. Please make sure Isabella San doesn't reach Asia San. You got it, Issei told him, turning to give chase. Udo kun, are you sure Akeno trailed off? Please, Akeno San. Make it quick. Kiba's smile became strained, the blade wavering ever so slightly again. Akeno sighed. I'll make it up to you. Lightning snarled down. Kiba managed to keep from crying out. The Nekamata twins were not so controlled. Bremery Knight, retired. Phoenix Pawn, retired. Phoenix Pawn, retired. As Kiba had said, Isabella was indeed going for Asia. The other rook had been the most observant one left and had sighted on Asia's position the moment the volley of arrows had been loosed. She was moving faster than a normal rook, not unlike Tsubasa when she was using momentum pillage to leech away an opponent's speed. Asia saw her coming. She paled, momentarily cowed by Isabella's pure determination, but bit her lip and manifested a magical shield before her. It buckled under the sheer force of Isabella's punch, but didn't collapse, and her teeth drew blood as she concentrated on boosting it. She didn't have to hold on for very long. Issei was right on Isabella's heels, but Kaneko reached her first. Like Isabella, Kaneko was far more agile than the average rook, and she was demonstrating it now as she drove Riser's last standing servant away from the magician. Her fists were cloaked in some kind of energy that wasn't elemental magic or demonic energy, and Isabella hissed as she blocked each strike with her forearms. Issei lined up his shot, electrokinesis flaring golden wide around his forearms, and yelled railgun. The clusters of roofing nails snarled forth at hypersonic speeds, leaving a mock cone behind them, and the sound was unmissable. Even fully committed to fending off Kaneko, Isabella's situational awareness was fine-tuned. She managed to twist herself enough so that the ferrokinetic attack only grazed her. Of course, with hypersonic rounds, only graze translated to left nasty wounds, but they were nothing that a rook's durability couldn't handle for a few minutes. 
until the nails turned on a dime and arsed towards her again. Brafia had been correct. Issei had been able to fine-tune Railgun and his fine control with Unknown Dictator, enough so that he actually could turn his projectiles into guided missiles. It was still early days, and steering them after launch meant he had to stay still and keep mentally correcting their course, but he was sure no one in Riser's peerage had seen it coming. Except, perhaps, Ravel. Why was he thinking about her right now? Certainly, Isabella didn't. Only as she sensed the movement behind her did she start to turn, and Kaneko and Asia both hit the deck and rolled. Issei felt another spike of guilt, stronger than he had with Shulin. He knew and respected Isabella, after all. But, again, this fight was literally a matter of life and death for him. Isabella didn't even cry out. A moment later, Grafia announced, her tone openly surprised now, Phoenix Rook, retired. She lapsed into a pensive silence, and when she spoke again, her voice was carefully neutral. Riser Sama, your entire peerage has been eliminated. Do you wish to concede the match at this time? For a moment, Issei held his breath. He could see Asia and Kaneko, who were in the process of standing and dusting themselves off, doing the same. He imagined that Akeno and Kaori and Saji and even Ria's were also waiting with bated breath. Certainly, Sona would be. After all they'd accomplished so quickly, it would be nice if Riser would have some sense. Naturally, he didn't. At first, the laugh was soft, almost musical, but it very quickly gained in volume, ringing with notes of disbelief and indignation. It wasn't, Issei thought resignedly, a very sane-sounding laugh. It cut off abruptly, and Riser spoke in a deeply affronted tone, as if speaking to anyone that wasn't him was somehow degrading to his dignity. I will not. If Riaz thinks she and her rabble can cheat their way to victory, they can come and meet me. Let them see the true power of a scion of the House of Phoenix. Be careful what you wish for, Riser, Riaz cautioned. My peerage is almost completely intact. Yours is in the recovery room. Incompetence and a little sister who doesn't know her place. Self-impressed confidence was slowly returning to Riser's voice. She'll learn. They'll suffer for their failure. You'll experience both, Riaz. Soon, you'll be begging for my forgiveness. I'll take that as a no then. Grafia's voice was dust dry. How are we handling this, Riaz? Akeno asked. I recommend Colony Drop. Seconded, Issei piped up immediately. We're almost completely whole. He felt a spike of guilt about Kiba, who had acted to protect him, but at least the knight was alive in the recovery room. And, Issei thought, he'd help put them in the current position. Agreed. Ria spoke positively, decisively. Everyone, Colony Drop is now in effect. We're taking him out. The plan had always amounted to all surviving peerage members converging on Riser's location and bombarding him while Saji sapped his immortality. Colony Drop, though, was the best case scenario and brought Ria's out of her base. Hopefully, this would mean that he'd get put down nice and fast. Hopefully. But God, Ika murmured. Look what they did to that jerk's peerage. He had it coming, Tsubasa murmured back, and there was very little sympathy in her tone. I feel kinda bad for them, but it sounds like Ravel Sama will take care of them. Almost done, Ria said softly. This is almost done her eyes glanced toward Sona, and after a moment Ika and Tsubasa looked her way as well. Drive it home, Sona whispered. Her eyes were fixed on the display, her hands gripping Issei's uniform blazer almost hard enough to tear it. Do it now, Anada. Okay, we're here. Kaori looked at Saji as they waited in the main school building's foyer. The pawn had promoted tonight for the broken field run to Riser's base, and he had kept half cringing the entire way there, as if expecting him to descend while throwing fireballs. Not an unreasonable fear, really, but still you sure you're up to this, Saji-kun. Saji nodded as he straightened up, color returning to his face. Yeah. Just nervous. I can understand that, Kaori told him. I know you'll be fine, though. She put as much reassurance into her tone as she could. He'd sure put in the work over the last week, and Absorption Line had proven that it could sap a devil's innate powers as much as anything from a sacred gear or holy sword. If it could weaken Rhea's power of destruction to the point where she was basically throwing paintballs, surely Riser's immortality wouldn't be immune. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw Saji forcing a determined expression onto his face. I'm sure Kaichi will be proud of you, she said neutrally. He winced slightly, then nodded. I hope so, he replied. But I'm not that worried about it right now. Ah. Kaori nodded, keeping a knowing smile off her face. It was more of a struggle than she expected. It's probably for the best. So you finally noticed Momo-san and Ruruko-chan, huh? Saji flushed, slumping his shoulders. After a moment, though, he let out a laugh. I suppose everyone else knew. Kaori patted his shoulder. Well, if it's any consolation, you weren't the only one who was clueless. Saji chuckled. I guess that's true. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you, she said, coloring slightly. 
Before she could say anything else, she heard footsteps, and it became clear from his expression that he did too. They turned to see Issei and the others entering the foyer, and she smiled at Issei. He returned it as he approached and reached out, squeezing her hands. She squeezed back, heedless of who might be watching. We're in the foyer, Akeno reported. We're just waiting on you, Ria's. I'm not coming. Ria's voice sounded glum over the peerage's communications network. I'm sorry. Go ahead without me. What do you mean, you're not coming in with us? Issei sounded slightly indignant. I assure you, it wasn't my idea. Ria's was started to sound pretty irritated, herself. Evidently Ani Sama thinks it's best if I stay where I am. Something about how the other pillar families would react to us ganging up on Riser in the endgame. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard, Kaneko retorted sourly. Kaori had to agree. I agree, Ria said darkly. For that matter, Ani Sama does, too. But he and Otu Sama are already getting calls about how needlessly brutal my peerage is being toward Risers. Never mind that they weren't holding back, either. So it's only okay if they and theirs do it, Kaori commented, letting out a snort. Her contemptuous tone was rather reflective of the general opinion towards the news. See, you're picking up devil politics already. Ria sighed. I think we can probably manage, Ria's, Akeno opined. She sounded just as disgusted, but she also sounded confident. Even without you, we're in a very good position. Yes, you are, the Gremory heiress admitted. Be careful about it, though. Kaori couldn't fault the note of caution in her voice. It was true that they had the best case scenario right at their fingertips, but Ria's power of destruction would have sealed the deal. I have every confidence in you, Ria's continued. All of them knew that too. It was Riser that she didn't trust good hunting. Riser was waiting for them atop the roof of the main building. He snarled as Issei and the others fanned out, half encircling him. The awareness of how quickly and deftly his peerage had been defeated was clearly taking its toll, whether he'd admit it or not. His eyes darted back and forth, and he moved with the jerky motions of someone in the throes of a full-bore adrenaline surge. There was more than that going on here, though. Finally, he snapped. His phoenix fire cloaked him like a shroud, flickering and dancing wildly. Good morning, Riser-san, Akeno said cheerfully. Your entire peerage is in the recovery room. I don't suppose we can convince you to end this gracefully. Low-born, half-crow bitch. Riser thundered. Now that Issei got a closer look at his eyes, he saw that his pupils were dilated. He really didn't look sane right now you you cheated. How? Issei snapped. By not standing there and letting you gun us down. Yes. Riser didn't even try to deny it. I'm Riser Phoenix, and you're low-born scum. You should be honored to have me kill you and take your sacred gear. You should all be honored to be my servants. Oh, beep you, you Yankee beeper. Issei snarled. His own pyrokinesis awakened in turn, blue-white flames wrapping around him like a lover. That's kind of redundant, Issei Kuhn, Akeno noted conversationally. Not helping, Akeno ni. The rook hissed. Promotion. Queen. Absorption line. Saji yelled, his sacred gear appearing around his left wrist. He manifested Absorption Line's tendrils and sent them snaking into Riser's phoenix flames. He winced at the sudden and painful spiritual feedback, but gritted his teeth and held on. Riser laughed at the pawn. Idiot. What do you think you're doing? Do you really think lowborns come like you can, eh? He blinked as his flames started flickering. For split seconds at a time, then for one second intervals. Do it now, you guys. Saji called out, blood starting to trickle from his nose. At the same time, he produced another tendril, snaking it up to Riser and attaching it to his right ankle. The pawn's nose started bleeding faster as a result, but he hung on for dear life. He shot out a last one towards Akeno, channeling the stolen demonic energy into Rhea's queen, and holy lightning began to skirl and crackle around her. Asia, grim-faced, stepped up beside Saji, manifesting the strongest magical barrier she could muster, and placing it in front of them. Thanks Saji. Eat this, asshole. Issei tossed his remaining ammunition into the air, shaping his hands into finger guns. The bundles of roofing nails broke apart, then spun around his hands and arms like the rotating barrels of twin gatling guns. As he did, he applied as much lightning magic as he could muster, wreathing his arms in golden white static electricity and air distortion. Railgun. He snapped, leveling his arms with a flourish, miming a firing action, and the nails exploded forth, crackling with enough electrical current to flash fry a razor back. He fired every round he had left. No time to hold back anything that could be spared. Sixty electrified roofing nails exploded into Riser Phoenix's face at somewhere north of Mach 6. With Saji's sacred gear sapping his pyrokinesis and regeneration, the result was predictable. Riser screamed in pain and staggered backwards, knocked ass over to Kettle by the sheer kinetic impact of so many projectiles hitting simultaneously. 
It was the scream of someone used to inflicting agony on others, but who had never experienced it himself. His entire upper body was a bloody mess. The iron projectiles that hadn't blown right through him pincushioned his torso, and his upper body still crackled with electricity. Somehow, though, he managed to keep from going entirely prone. His wounds were starting to knit, but with agonizing slowness. The minute his projectiles had hit, Issei summoned his mother's blue-white fire around his hands. Wreck it Dan. He snarled, starting to pelt Riser with the explosive flames as he approached. Senpai Saji started to call out, but Akeno was already responding. She spread out her hands, her signature magical circles flaring to life, and her holy lightning began to rain down upon the Phoenix King. Enhanced with Storm Dancer and the power stolen from Riser, she had become a one-woman thunderstorm, a walking person of mass destruction, and it showed. The holy lightning bit into Riser's body again and again, causing more screams and an unpleasant fragrance of scorched flesh. The queen curled her lips upward in a cruelly pleased smile and kept the holy attacks coming. The goal, of course, was to pile on the hurt faster than his body could heal it. Saji was managing to weaken both Riser's pyrokinesis and his regeneration, but even though he was promoted to bishop, it was taking almost everything he had. It was up to Issei and Akeno to finish this as fast as possible. Issei knew he was short on ammo now and that Akeno had the ranged combat covered, so he needed to be doing what a rook was actually supposed to be good for. With a snarl, he hurled himself at Riser, an unknown dictator called the remaining ferris debris to him, shaping it into jagged, spiked gauntlets around his hands. He charged the gauntlets with fire and lightning and drove one into the high-class devil's face and then the other. Kaneko dove in from the other side, keeping her punches and blows low to try and keep Riser off his feet. Clusters of shadow blades kept popping up in his shadow, as well, courtesy of Kaori. The knight kept jerking her blade around randomly, trying to keep Riser hemmed in and unable to catch his breath. Rinse and repeat. No time to hold anything back, after all. Holy lightning snapped down in the seconds between Issei's and Kaneko's strikes. He and Akeno had put a lot of effort into synchronizing their attacks. It had only taken a few accidental zaps with that attack, probably accidental, it was Akeno, after all, to convince him to tighten up his timing. As they curbstomped Riser, Issei got another good look at his wounds, and what he saw was heartening. Absorption line was doing the job, slowing Riser's healing factor considerably. He was a scorched crackling, bloody mess, though, and the fact that he had kept trying to pull himself back upright was not encouraging. Was it just willpower or spite that had put him back on his feet, or was it something more? The thought wouldn't quite let go, and suddenly Riser was reacting. His expression was angry and agonizing, but somehow he was managing to push through the pain long enough to shove past Issei and pull together his phoenix fire. Issei whipped back around to him, already beginning to form Rekka dance, but he was merely a talented beginner. Riser had the advantage of lifelong training in his pyrokinesis, and he was sending it pouring forth in a torrent at Asia. Beeping Willworker Whore. He howled furiously. Asia's barrier flared brightly, resisting the brilliant flames. After a few minutes, however, it began buckling and showing cracks. Smoke and sparks grilled around her, but she gritted her teeth and pushed her will into it. Saji-san, keep draining him. She gritted out, sweat plastering her golden bangs to her forehead. Doing my best. Saji yelled back. Do you want me to move so he'll lighten up on you? Crack started spiderwebbing across the shield again, and this time Asia's will wasn't sufficient to smooth them away. She shook her head sharply, instead shifting so that her body was fully in front of Saji's. The pawn started to protest, but snapped his mouth shut, instead pushing as much of his own will into absorption line as he could. The faster he could finish this. The say resumed firing wreck at Dan's at Riser, and the high-class devil was now ablaze in blue flame. His howls of anger and pain began to swing more towards pain, but his attack on Asia continued unabated. It was as if taking her down would be a moral victory for him. Damn it, stop. Issei yelled. Stop it now, damn it. That only made Riser smile, albeit a smile that was pained. A moment later, he wasn't smiling anymore and was in fact toppling over, his torrent of phoenix fire lashing upwards at nothing before petering out. Asia's barrier shattered and she slumped to the ground, barely conscious, but her face etched with relief. Issei blinked, looking to see Kaori. He blurted out, pleasantly surprised. The knight had stepped through his shadow while his attention had been totally on Asia, beginning an Ayajutsu draw even before she'd finished the transit. Yuzorajiri had made a bloody hash of his hamstrings, and the holy sword's touch further blunted his weakened regeneration. Yet, even as she whirled the blade above his head to deliver a coup de grace, Riser managed one last burst of phoenix fire right into Kaori's face. She only had time to widen her eyes. Bremery Knight, retired, Grafia pronounced, her tone softly disapproving. By now, she had abandoned any pretense of neutrality. Kaori. Issei screamed as the knight disappeared in a flash of light. 
His eyes shifted back to Riser, his nostrils flaring, and with a cry of rage he surged upwards, exploding into his dragon form. His shriek now taking on a basso quality, he spat his mother's blue-white flames at the Phoenix King. As they struck Riser, he hurled himself after the attacks, dropping his bulk onto Riser, then rearing back and doing it again, and then again, and yet again. By the third impact, the rooftop was cracked and buckling. Issei's friends could only stare, awestruck. Well, that, and keep moving so that they weren't quite standing at ground zero. Sweet Mayu, Ravel whispered, watching the carnage unfold. She'd been right, after all. That was indisputable. But she hadn't expected to be this right. Rhea's servants were fighting with everything they had, as if their lives depended on a win. It wasn't even a lie. Haidu Sen's life clearly hung in the balance, although she had a suspicion that several people in Sona Sen's peerage, including Sona Sen herself, had planned for the possibility of failure. They were throwing what was that human expression. Everything but the kitchen sink, that was it. That's what they were throwing at Ani Sama. And Ani Sama had no choice but to take it exactly as he'd left his opponents with no choice. It was a testament to his strength as a high-class devil that he hadn't keeled over immediately, but it was just a matter of time at this point. The pawn with the Vritra gear was the one making it possible, she wondered who had come up with that idea. It was undeniably clever. And the holy swordswoman had sealed the deal with her last strike, effectively immobilizing Ani-sama. But it was Himajima-san and Haidu-san who were carrying the weight of this, and the sheer destructive power they had brought to bear was staggering. And then Mureyama had been retired, and Haidu had gone berserk. The outcome was no longer in doubt. No one, save perhaps Ani-sama with his near-unassailable arrogance, could doubt it. Ravel just hoped Ani-sama had enough sense to resign before anything permanent happened. Maybe this would be good for him, teach him not to treat his opponents with contempt. She hoped. The say reverted to human form, and there was murder in his eyes. Resign now. He made a sharp gesture, and the remaining ferrous debris shaped itself into scores of electrified flechettes, hovering in the air and poised to strike. He pointed them at Riser's inner thighs. Truth be told, he was pissed off enough to want to do it even if Riser did surrender. Seeing him blast Kaori out of the game had made his blood boil. Only the knowledge that she was actually alive and being healed was staying his hand. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw that Saji was not only on his knees, but was half bent over, struggling to stay awake. Absorption line's tendrils were glowing and shimmering in a fashion that was not reassuring. Akeno was in slightly better shape, but she was clearly exhausted from being a one-woman photokinetic supercell. Asia was clearly on the verge of passing out, and Kaneko was upright but haggard. If Riser managed to rally now, he wasn't sure they could repulse him again. Resign now, damn it, or I'll make a pincushion out of your nads. He thundered, trembling. Eh fine fine. Riser snarled or tried to. It came out as closer to a petulant whimper. He was prone, his wounds still open and bleeding, his hamstrings still bloodied and severed from Kaori's last-ditch attack, his body crackling from multiple electrical strikes and smoking from the wholly aspected attacks and wrecked Dan blasts. Multiple bones cracked or broken from Issei's repeated draconic body slams, his regeneration slowed almost to nil, his phoenix's fire flickering and stuttering. He was the picture of defeat and looked as though he were dining on ashes. I I resigned he vanished from the rooftop in a flare of light. The next king, resigned. Grafia's voice was quietly relieved. Winner, Rhea's Gremory's peerage. Congratulations. Issei sagged to his knees in relief, the ferrous fragments falling to the ground. He looked over at the others, giving them a grin of approval. Asia managed a weary smile. Oh. Good. It's over. She sank down against the wall, closing her eyes. Issei had never realized that she snored. An echo leaned against the wall herself, looking up at the faux sky. That was too close, she said solemnly. Issei nodded, rubbing his neck. Yeah. Saji flopped over on his side, pulling himself into a cross-legged sitting position after a moment. Absorption line's tendrils finally flickered out, and the gauntlet vanished with an almost audible sigh of relief. He returned Issei's smile with an exhausted one of his own, and then said tiredly, I'll make a pincushion out of your nads. What are you, Ten? It was the first thing to come to mind. Issei protested, his cheeks heating. Akeno lowered herself carefully into Siza, smiling slyly. I think you made the right move, Issei Kun. As you've seen, Riser is motivated primarily by his ego and libido. Because of Saji Kun, the risk of losing the source of the latter, even if he knows intellectually that it can be healed. The rooftop disappeared in a wash of sparkling light, and Issei found himself and the others in the viewing gallery. The first thing he saw was Sona and Kaori approaching him. He rose carefully to his feet, just in time to be knocked back against the wall by the force of their combined embrace. Easy, he said softly, wrapping his arms tightly around them and kissing their cheeks. It's fine, we're fine. 
He kept repeating this over and over, kissing first Sona's hair, then Kaori's, trying to lose himself in their combined scent. His exhaustion was making it hard to stay upright, even with a rook's resilience, but he wasn't about to let himself fall over until they relaxed. That was his intention, anyway. No sooner had Sona's mouth than Kaori's found his, then tension started leaving his body. He slumped against the two of them, a silly smile on his face. As such, he wasn't sure just who started the clapping, but soon the viewing gallery rang with the sounds of celebration. Sona stepped out of the ensuite bathroom, smoothing down her dress. She gave Issei a slightly nervous smile. How does it look? You look amazing, Issei told her, trying not to drool. She wore a fulling sheath dress that matched her eyes. It had spaghetti straps and was slid up her left thigh to allow for movement. She wore matching heels and carried a matching clutch under her left arm. Her customary gold hair clip was still in place, but a delicate-looking hairpin made from malachite held her hair up in a quasi-French twist. He couldn't tell whether she was wearing light blush or was simply flushed. Either way, he wanted to kiss her until they were both out of breath, and he told her as much. Sona smirked and gave him a quick kiss. Consider that a down payment for later. She looked to say up and down as well, clearly pleased with what she saw. I very much like what I see, as well. That tuxedo suits you. Glad you think so, he said, rubbing the back of his neck. The Gremory tailors work fast, I guess. He gave himself a critical side eye in the mirror. The black tuxedo and matching loafers fit him almost as well as the suit Sona had gotten him. It was slightly different than the norm, featuring an ivory banded collar shirt, a double breasted jacket, and a cherry red pocket square. He'd done his best to tame his hair into something resembling respectable, but that was probably a lost cause at this point. You're going to hold on to that tux, Sona told him. Her smirk had turned into a proud smile, as if she were a wife whose husband was about to receive a prestigious award. Which, when he thought about it, wasn't all that far off the mark. I think there'll be quite a few instances where you'll need it. I don't doubt it, Issei replied, his own smile a little rueful. Sounds a little exhausting. We'll minimize how much that interferes with us, she promised him, and looked up. The smile turned thoughtful. That'll be Kaori. You sound awfully certain of that, he commented, and opened the door. For the second time in five minutes, his eyes went wide, and he was stunned speechless by feminine beauty. Hi. Kaori didn't quite meet his eyes, and her cheeks were pink. She wore a midnight blue tomasode with a crimson obi, and her hair was tied in a high ponytail with a ribbon that matched her obi. It made her look a little like a keno, but she pulled the look off way better in Issei's opinion. Finally, she met his eyes and smiled softly. Ice, look at you you look so handsome tonight. You too, he told her quickly. I mean, gorgeous. Both of you. Thank you, she said, and shifted her gaze to Sona, relaxing slightly. Sona sand, that dress is beautiful. You look great. As do you, Kaori, Sona said approvingly. And as far as I'm concerned, you can forego the honorific when it's just us. Sona, then, Kaori said slowly, clearly testing how the words felt on her lips. That'll take some getting used to. Her smile had relaxed by now, though. Are you too ready? I think the party's ready to begin. I'm still surprised that Rhea Senpai's parents went ahead with the party, Issei commented. I thought they wanted the marriage. Lord Gremory is a nice man, but not reliably resolute, Sona answered, wrinkling her nose slightly. I believe he had buyer's remorse about the arrangement almost immediately, but couldn't find what he felt was a respectable way to free Rias from it. And Lady Gremory was never happy with it to begin with. She shrugged. So, now it's a celebration for her peerage and allies' victory in her first rating game. The food was already made, after all. I guess that's the kind of thing we'll have to learn to deal with, Kaori said. Yes. Sona nodded in confirmation. The learning curve should be far gentler than this, though. She gave her Ruck and Knight now, her future husband and co-wife an approving look. You too, and Saji Kun, made the victory possible, and the House of Gremory realizes that. Whatever anyone else may think, you're heroes. So enjoy the party. She caught the look in Issei's eye and smirked. No, Issei Kun, we can't just skip the party and hang out here. Peori pinked again, but this time it was at least half from trying to suppress a snicker. Issei turned cherry red and grinned bashfully. Stop seeing right through me, Sona-chan. Stop being transparent then, Ice, Kaori laughed and took his left arm. She's right, Anada, Sona said, her smirk turning back into a smile. She sidled up on his right side, claiming that arm. Issei looked from right to left. Their scents were, somehow, blending harmoniously. It was as though the kitchen window had been thrown open and the floral scents from the garden were wafting into the house while the fresh-baked cookie aroma was seeping out. Words couldn't fully describe how he felt right now. Overjoyed probably came closest, although somehow, it didn't feel quite complete. Like there was still a missing piece or two or maybe three no, he told himself, that would be greedy, at least for right now. 
are you ready? Tsona nodded, and Kaori said, let's go. All right, then, he agreed, and the three of them strode down the hall towards the ballroom. The rest of Sona's peerage awaited them outside the double doors, and formal wear was apparently the uniform of the day. Tsubaki was dressed similarly to Kaori, but her tomasode was a deep forest green. She shifted slightly on her feet, her equivalent of anyone else's blatant fidgeting. Clearly, she was eager to join the party or to see Kiba. It was probably the same thing to her. Amo wore a wide A-line dress with an embellished halter bodice. Her hair was out of its normal twin tails, styled into a neat half-updo, and she was already catching admiring looks from the male devils coming in and out of the ballroom. Honestly, all the girls in the peerage were, but Tomo seemed to be a special case. It was probably her innate upbeatness. The fact that she was virtually vibrating with excitement probably didn't hurt, though. Saji was also in a tuxedo, though his dinner jacket was snow white to contrast with the jet black pants. He wore a wine red bow tie and black oxfords, and kept fiddling with his tie. Baruko wore a navy blue A-line dress with a lace bodice. She wore her hair down and wavy tonight, which prompted a double take from Issei, and snickers from Sona and Kaori. Momo wore a teal knee-length sheath dress with corset-style ties, crisscrossing down her back. She smiled and moved easily in it, as if she'd long since become accustomed to such dresses. Both she and Raruko were clearly oriented on Saji, and remarkably, he was not only aware this time, but was reciprocating. Issei relaxed his shoulders slightly and caught a curious look from Kaori out of the corner of his eye. Sona just nodded slightly, it was unsurprising that she'd already sussed out what was going on. Issei then spotted his last three peerage mates, and for a moment he had trouble breathing. It was just like seeing Sona and Kaori, if not quite as intense yet. Somehow, he knew that the yet was undeniable. Tsubasa wore a knee-length dress with an illusion inset bodice, and it highlighted her figure magnificently. The dress was a shade or two lighter than her hair, which was worn normally. It was almost as if that were a nonchalant statement of there's only so dressy you can get me, and it worked with that dress. Oh, man, did it work. The scent of fresh picked strawberries that always surrounded her started to grow stronger. Her lips quirked upward in a smile as her eyes met his. Ria was dressed in a tulip skirt v-neck wrap party dress with spaghetti straps. Issei would later realize that the dress perfectly matched his pocket square. The bodice did very nice things for her bust, and Issei couldn't quite keep his eyes off the floppy side tie. The thought of tugging it loose flashed through his mind, and Ria's tolerant smile suggested that she guessed the direction his thoughts went. The bishop wore her long hair down tonight, it fell past her waist, and was wavy and lustrous. That fragrance that he associated with her the baked apples and cinnamon, was stronger than it had ever been before. Finally, Ika's hair was actually somewhat tamed. Her bangs were neatly combed, and her hair was out of its usual messy cute pigtails, instead styled into a neat medium-length braid draped over her left shoulder. She was dressed in a strapless wine-colored jersey-style sheath dress, with a black bolero jacket worn over it. This was the first time Issei had seen her wear something that really featured her cleavage, and it was a real struggle to keep his eyes above her waist this time. She smirked a good-natured smirk in response, and her own eyes dipped down for a moment, the smirk momentarily becoming an approving grin. He could almost taste the peppermint ice cream and cold milk that she smelled like. He cleared his throat and had to clear it again before he could actually speak. Everyone looks great tonight. You too, Ikin, Tsubasa told him with a smile. Tsubaki nodded briskly. Indeed. Shall we, Kaichu? Sona gave her a go-ahead gesture. By all means. Tsubaki pushed the double doors open, and Sona Citri's peerage entered the ballroom. Is that him, Alivan? The Aguirre's queen looked at his king. Yes, Sekvera Sama. That's Haidu Issei. Interesting. The beautiful, bespectacled woman beat her head, studying the young man. You know his father, correct? She asked. Yes, he's an old friend. Haidu Goru is a Japanese dragon of some note. Some of it is even complimentary. He snorted in mild amusement, smirking as he poked good-natured fun at his friend's reputation. Sekvera smiled faintly herself. She knew her queen's sense of humor well. So you believe the report from their match? Indeed, I do. The dragon turned devil stroked his chin. He has both his parents' talents, and it's rather telling that he won Sona Sama's heart. He's definitely one to watch. I think I agree, Sekvera mused softly, sipping at her flute of champagne. Her face was impassive, but her Sarah's eyes were thoughtful. That's the guy who kicked Riser Phoenix's ass. The thuggish-looking man with spiky teal hair shook his head in disbelief. I don't believe it. He looks like a stiff wind could knock him on his ass. Don't judge a book by its cover, Zephyrder. At the sound of the gentle chiding, Zephyrder turned a dirty look on the speaker. The well-built man, goateed man had a completely shaved head and wore ceremonial armor over his formal robes. The look was typical of his uncle Falbium or, as he was better known, Falbium Asmodeus. 
He may not look like much, the elder devil continued amiably, but both Seraphal and Ajuka consider him a friend. Not to mention Sona. Remember, she doesn't suffer fools lightly. I don't know what you're talking about, Oji-san, Zephyrder snorted. She's never been particularly kind to me. The brief smirk on Falbium's face confused him. That's as may be, then, Falbium added after a moment. Be cordial, at least, if you two encounter each other tonight. Zephyrder shrugged. He had better things to do than deal with a jumped-up reincarnate tonight. So. That's the boy they're already calling the Phoenix Buster. The speaker was a lovely blonde with turquoise eyes, clad in a simple but elegant gown. So it is, her companion agreed. His hair was bluish-black and slightly shaggy, his eyes violet, and the understated cut of his formal clothes did little to disguise the restrained power in his physique. Watch the rest of the pillars present. All they seem to see is a reincarnate. He snorted softly. Idiots. Not one of them seems to have seen the footage from Kyoto. Why would they? What's there that's important to a member of the pillars? The woman's tone was a nearly pitch-perfect mockery of an average scion of the 72 pillars. I've heard the tongue wagging about Sona-sama. There's more than one young man pissed off that she wouldn't be reasonable with her standards, and the thought of a reincarnate just pisses them off. We already knew the underworld was full of idiots, Kusha, he said, smiling faintly. I imagine she's paying them exactly as much attention as they deserve. None, you mean, Kusha replied with a grin. He nodded a salute to her, but his eyes kept drifting back to the young man. If I didn't know better, Sereerg Sama, I'd think you had a crush, she teased. You're the only one for me, Kusha. Sereerg reached up and caressed her face, a rare moment of public affection. But he's intriguing. He was silent for a moment, then nodded. Remind me to speak to Sona at the young devil's gathering. I want to see her peerage in action. I had thought that it would be Riaz who would put together a true challenge, but he trailed off meaningfully. Yes, Sereerg Sama. You all look wonderful. Riaz met them with a huge smile. She wore a close-fitting cyan beep-tail dress that matched her eyes. Please, let me introduce my parents. She gestured to two elegantly attired figures who looked little older than Serzich's. My father, Ziodicus, Duke of Gremory, and his lady wife, my mother Venelana. Otusama, Akasama, these are the members of Sona's peerage who helped mine triumph. She first indicated Saji. Saji Genshiru Kun, her pawn. Her hand then gestured to Kaori. Murayama Kaori san, her newest knight. Finally, she turned to Issei. And her new rook, Haidu Issei Kun. That smile turned mischievous. He's also her fiance. We've heard about all of you. Ziodicus wore his hair long and sported a tidy goatee. He shook each of their hands in turn and looked especially pleased to meet Issei. I'm most grateful to the three of you for assisting Rias. Yes, indeed. Venelana was, essentially, a slightly older version of Rias with light brown hair, albeit with violet eyes, and her dress made the most of her exquisite figure. Sona-chan, everyone, we owe you a debt. She grimaced, giving her husband a mildly baleful look. We really never should have agreed to that engagement in the first place. Ziodicus didn't exactly cringe, but it was clear that he was cowed by his wife. It was more than a little reminiscent of Serzich's and Grafia. I know Lana. I already agreed with you about that. Issei rubbed the back of his head. It was no trouble, really, he said. It was a blatant lie, of course, but it was the kind of blatant lie polite society demanded. We were glad to help. And that only makes us more grateful. Venelana gave Issei a motherly smile. Please, make yourselves at home. Rias gestured expansively to the massive ballroom. The buffet table and open bar were already doing a brisk trade, and couples were circulating through the dance floor. It's as much your party as mine, now. There are people here who don't like that fact, but they can go to heaven. Language, Riaz, Venelana said mildly. Riaz just snorted, and Venelana made a show of shaking her head at her daughter's unladylike behavior. It had the appearance of an old family joke, and Issei couldn't help joining in the ripple of laughter. There you guys are. Issei turned and blinked. For a moment, he seemed to be staring at a slightly older version of himself and Kaori, except he was wearing glasses, and she had her combed back in a neat ponytail. Then the penny dropped, and he realized he was looking at his parents as they truly were. One more thing to get used to, he thought. Aloud, he said, I didn't know you were looking for us, Tusan, Kasan. Seraphol san asked us to make sure you guys stayed put, Goru said cheerily. She has someone she wants you to meet. Out of the corner of his eye, Issei say Sona's expression shift to curiosity. Zia Tikisan, Venelana san, it's been some time. You're both looking very well. As are you two, Ziodicus answered, inclining his head. When was the last time? That dreadful business in Tanegashima. I believe so. Ryo gave them a polite bow. It's good to see you two again. You have no excuse not to visit, Venelana said meaningfully. Particularly since our children know each other now. There really isn't anyone you two don't know, is there? 
Issei said, his tone somewhere between amused and exasperated. He still had no idea why he'd been kept in the dark about his parents' involvement with the supernatural world, although he was starting to think it stemmed from all the introductions they would have had to make. Oh, good. Seraphil approached. For once, she wasn't dressed like a magical girl. The long gray skirt, forest green blouse and black casket made her look like a schoolteacher, but the effect was surprisingly professional for the first time, Issei mused, she looked like the co-ruler of devilkind that she was. Seraphil was accompanied by four people. The first, her body language strangely reminiscent of Tsubaki's when she was around Sona, was a quietly pretty girl with wine-colored eyes and wavy, shoulder-length pinkish beige hair. She wore a dove gray sheath dress with a wine-colored wrap around her shoulders and radiated an aura of calm competence. The second was a handsome blonde man with a sleepily amiable expression. His golden eyes seemed to be almost completely closed, although when Issei caught sight of them, they were piercingly intelligent. He wore a cobalt blue tailored business suit with a black Oxford shirt and crimson necktie, and seemed to be nursing a glass of something electric blue. Literally electric, in this case, Issei could swear that he saw actual sparks of static electricity in the azure liquid. He and the pink-haired girl had their bodies subtly oriented on each other. Something about them suggested that they had known each other for a long time, in every possible interpretation of the word. The third was a man who appeared to be in healthy, vigorous middle age. He had iron-gray hair and aquiline features, and his brown eyes were both gentle and wise. Even the scar across his face only added to his air of quiet gravitas. Like the blonde man, he wore a dark blue suit, although his white shirt was a banded collar one, just like Issei's. The last figure was a beautiful Eurasian woman in a black beep-tailed dress. She wore her dark hair up in a loose bun and had her hands wrapped around the gray-haired man's arm. She appeared to be a few years younger than her companion and gave off an air of calm, confident competence. Like the other pair, she and her companion seemed to have been lovers for a long time. Sona spoke, her tone one of pleased surprise. Oji-sama. Catherine Abasama. She smiled with an intensity Issei had rarely seen. Hello, Sona-chan. The man offered her a hug and they embraced enthusiastically, and the scene repeated a moment later with the Eurasian woman. Eventually, Sona turned back towards Issei, still smiling, Oji-sama, this is Haidu Issei-kun and Murayama Kaori, my fiancés. She pinked slightly as she said that, but still looked pleased. Issei Kun, Kaori, this is my uncle, Valen Sitri, and my aunt, his queen and wife, Catherine Sakai. And with them are one Isama's queen, Behemoth San, and her bishop, Ziz San. Issei bowed quickly and deeply. Somehow, he was more impressed by these people than by the demeanor that Devilkind's actual rulers seemed to present. Ah. Um, I'm pleased to meet you all. Kaori did likewise, although he sensed some mild amusement from her. Nice to formally meet you, Haidu Kun, Behemoth said with a wry smile. And you, Murayama san. All I can say is that you must have made quite the impression on Ravel Chan. She made a point of contacting me on your behalf. That has to be an exaggeration, Issei felt his face heat slightly. Balin offered Issei his hand. It's nice to finally meet you, Issei Kun. Sona's spoken of little beside you in her letters. After shaking his hand, he shook Kaori and Saji's hands in turn, before turning his slight smile on Ria's. Ria's Chan, you're looking well. Thank you. It's been ages, Ria's replied, her smile now more relaxed. It's a pleasant surprise to see you here. I thought you were still studying in Torino. We're taking a break, Catherine explained. Valen wanted to come back and touch base with family. And Seraphil knew we'd come back to the underworld, Valen finished. She has a sense for that sort of thing. He smiled. Don't let us keep you guys from enjoying the party, though. We'll be in the underworld for a while. There'll be plenty of time for us to catch up. Sona a bitter lip, looking torn. Are you sure, Oji-sama? Go on with you. Catherine gave Sona a gentle quasi-shove. Have fun with your friends. Sona nodded after a minute, reaching for Issei's hand. He felt Kaori take his other one. We'll see you later, then. Thus let us old folks catch up with each other, Goro opined, chuckling. Sona smiled slightly and let Issei tug her and Kaori in the direction of the dance floor. She let out a sigh of satisfaction. That was a nice surprise from one Isama. Yeah, Issei agreed. Your aunt and uncle seem nice. What did Senpai mean about them studying somewhere? Kaori asked curiously as they weaved their way through the dancing couples. Are they teachers or something? Sort of, Sona explained. They're explorers and archaeologists. Oji Sama's specialty is finding and researching sacred gears. He'll probably want to quiz you about yours at some point, Issei Kun. That seems fair, Issei said. Maybe he'll be able to tell me something that Ajuka-sama can't. It's possible, Sona told him. He and Ajuka-sama are generally considered our leading experts on sacred gears. 
There are rumors, though, that the leader of the Fallen Angels may know even more, I doubt you'll have a chance to ask him anytime soon, though. Probably not, Kaori opined. Let's let that rest for the moment, though. She grinned to say. I think you owe us some dances. Hmm. I think Kaori is right, Sona said, her smile shifting into a smirk. Trade off. Kaori nodded, making a show of looking thoughtful. I assume you want to go first. This time, you can, Sona told her, catching Rhea's making her way towards them. I think Rhea's wants to talk first. But I will be along to collect soon. I don't get a choice in this, do I? Issei tried to sound put upon, but he could not muster any kind of real objection. His fiancés turned to him, affection and amusement writ plain on their features. Nope, they said in unison. I still can't believe we pulled it off. Rhea's was giddy. She had been giddy, in fact, since the end of the match. She had also, Sona observed with mildly concerned amusement, not slept a wink since its conclusion. Everyone else had, she and Issei had collapsed on the bed in their guest suite sometime around 2 a.m., too drained to even fool around. They'd only stirred long enough to pull Kaori into the pile when she'd come to check on them. I had faith, Sona told her with a smile. It was a little close at times, but you grabbed the initiative and kept the momentum. She raised a flute of sparkling cider in a salute. You did well. With your help, Ria's replied, returning the toast. And your people. Especially Haidu Kun. She glanced across the room, and Sona followed her eyes. What she saw made her grin. Issei and Kaori, trying their best not to stumble their way through waltz, but having fun flailing around together. It's almost a pity I didn't meet him first, Ria said, her voice faintly wistful. Sona snorted, shaking her head. I don't think we'd share well. No, probably not. It was Ria's turn to let out an amused snort. If only he had a twin brother. I'm not comfortable with where this is going, Sona said, her tone suddenly going cool. Rias waved her hands quickly in protest. Don't worry. I couldn't ever see him as anything but a little brother. Someone like him, though she shook her head. After all, it's not like the issue is resolved forever. Sooner or later, someone's going to Suitako to Sama again, and this time, they'll know better than to give me a loophole. Sona looked at her thoughtfully. After several minutes, during which Rias began to squirm under the scrutiny, she finally said, maybe what you need is something to hold those suitors at bay. Just until you can find a more permanent solution. Rias nodded slowly. That's exactly what I need. She beeped her head, narrowing her eyes slightly. What are you thinking of? Sona nodded towards the door to the balcony. Not in here. Too many prying ears. It had been a good night, Issei reflected. Alternating dancing with Sona and Kaori had been fun, even if he still had two left feet when it came to actual dances themselves. At least with slow dances, though, it was more an excuse to hold each other and sway to the music than anything else. The slow love song being played was winding down when he realized someone was waiting for him. Tsubasa stood there, smiling lopsidedly. There was an odd something to that smile, though. Mind if I cut in? Issei's eyes shifted to Kaori, who raised both eyebrows. After a moment, she smirked good-naturedly and held up a finger. One dance. You may get more if you behave. She slid gracefully out of Issei's arms. I'm going to get something to eat. Want me to fix you a plate? Yeah, thank you. They had what looked like some yakitori skewers. Kaori slapped him gently on the shoulder. Find me when you're done. Have fun she glided off into the crowd, humming softly. You two seem to be having a good time tonight, Tsubasa teased as they danced. His fellow rook was almost as light on her feet as Kaori, and slightly better at compensating for Issei's clumsiness. So do you, Issei countered lightly, trying to will the heat away from his face. It wasn't working. The two of them worked their way around the dance floor, and the scent of freshly picked strawberries grew stronger in his nostrils. He could almost taste them. He wanted to know if her kisses would taste like them. I can't just keep tamping it down, he thought to himself. I want Basa-chan, too. And Aika-san, and Ryasan. And the more I think about it, the more I think that they don't mind the idea. Hey, he said softly. I want to talk to you about something. As she beeped her head thoughtfully, he hurriedly added, nothing bad. Just something that's been on my mind. Tomorrow. Sure, Tsubasa replied. Her smile turned slightly mischievous. Just me. Issei chuckled nervously. No. MMM. That's about what I thought. That admission on her part raised his eyebrows. Tsubasa just grinned at his reaction. Tomorrow, then. Talk to the others. Well. That was quite a party. Issei grinned punchily at Sona and Kaori, and their smiles of response were just as sloppy and tired. For all the pomp and spectacle of the ball, they hadn't actually stayed that long. After about two hours, Rias had quietly beckoned Sona over, and after a moment she'd assembled her peerage alongside Rias. Seraphal, Behemoth and Ziz had been present as well, and, much to Issei's surprise, his parents, as well as Serzich's and Grafia and Sona's aunt and uncle, 
had been there too. Bria's had worn an impish smile as she summoned a teleportation circle and whisked all of them away. When the light faded, they were standing in the very same Karak joint where they'd celebrated Freed Selzin's defeat. And this time, the Grimmery heiress announced gleefully, she'd arranged for them to have the complete run of the place. They violated numerous noise ordinances that evening. By even human standards, this more informal victory party wasn't particularly wild to say didn't think there had been any orgies, although he hadn't tried too hard to keep track of where his parents had gotten off to. But the very informality of it, Sona and Riaz had both had pointed comments on the judgmental eyes of the other pillar families, coupled with the slow bleeding tension and giddiness from the day's earlier events, had brought with it a need to relax and let loose. And if that caused them to be overly enthusiastic with the mics and equipment, well, the House of Grimmery was well known for its generosity. And that, he concluded muzzily, was why they were only returning to the Grimmery estate at 2.30 in the morning. It probably would have been later, if Grafia had not been drunk enough to start singing Said. According to Riaz, that was a sure sign that she and Serzich's were about to get amorous in public. Issei was both relieved and disappointed to miss that. So Kaori leaned against him, as he slipped one arm around her waist and the other around Sona's. Now what? Well, how about this? Issei leaned down, and they kissed lingeringly. As they slowly broke the kiss, he turned toward Sona, and their kiss lingered longer. Sona reached out, wrapping one arm around Kaori's waist, and she let out a soft sound as she was drawn closer. In the dim light, her expression was both anticipatory and nervous. Issei managed a reassuring smile. The urge to be balls deep inside both his fiancés, simultaneously, and somehow he knew that was possible, even if he didn't know how, threatened to overwhelm him for a moment, but he managed to choke it back. We don't have to rush things. We can move as quickly, or as slowly, as you're comfortable with. Yes. After all, you and Issei Kun have only been engaged for a day, Sona agreed, her voice soft and husky now. It made her sound even more erotic than usual, and Issei suppressed a shiver. You don't need to push yourself further than you're ready for, Kaori. Kaori's expression mingled relief and guilt, disappointment and desire. I want to do stuff. I'm just not ready for that tonight. I wish I were. We waited a whole week after we got together, Sona said, her smile atypically mischievous. Kaori's face pinked prettily, and she laughed. A whole week. Now that's willpower. I have an idea to relax us, Sona continued. We don't need to rush, and it's better that we simply enjoy each other's company, rather than try to reach notional milestones. Her violet eyes shone in the dim light. Interested. Kaori beat her head, her body language relaxing. What did you have in mind? Oh my god, it is. Kaori pointed at the widescreen TV, her expression disbelieving. That is a paper match MRI machine. Right? Issei said in a vindicated tone, and Sona nodded firmly in agreement. The three of them sat on the large couch facing the TV, snacks and drink sitting on the coffee table before them. Issei wore boxers and a t-shirt, while Sona wore skimpy sleep shorts and a camisole, and Kaori wore an ISF t-shirt over her panties. The three of them were half cuddled on the couch together, a comforter draped over them, watching a movie whose ineptitude beggared the imagination. This this is deliberately bad, right? Kaori asked hopefully. Some kind of satire parody. Sona shook her head. The interviews we found with the director strongly suggest that he thinks he made a straightforward murder mystery. Is he high? Or an idiot? I believe both, Issei commented. He held Sona's left hand in his right, their fingers interlaced, and his left arm was draped around Kaori's shoulders. She was snuggled in comfortably underneath it. It just keeps getting better. Watch. Kaori nodded dubiously, reaching out and grabbing the bowl of popcorn. As they nibbled at the contents, she commented, this is some of the worst acting I've ever seen and I was in drama club in middle school. I remember that, Issei said. I hate to say it, but that production of Romeo and Juliet in second year was really, really bad. I wish I could argue that, she said glumly. The three of them snuggled closer under the comforter as the movie progressed along its alleged plot. I suppose you're all wondering why I called you here today, Issei joked weakly. He sat on a padded bench on one of the Grimmery Estates verandas, flanked by Sona and Kaori. Tsubasa, Ria, and Ika sat across from them on another bench. Between them sat a low table with six glasses and a large crystalline carafe of lemonade. Riaz had arranged for it without even needing to be asked, prompting Issei to suspect that she and Sona had had a chat. For obvious reasons, breakfast had been shelved in favor of a very late brunch. It was just as well. About the time breakfast would have normally been served well, neither Issei nor his fiancés would have been in any way presentable for the meal. Falling asleep at awkward angles on the couch tended to produce that effect. Now, the early afternoon following the party, everyone was back to looking more or less like themselves. Not so dolled up anymore, but the five of them still took Issei's breath away. The way they were now, the way they really were, that was what he had fallen for. 
after what felt like an eternity, an awkward silence rang out in the late morning air. Then Tsubasa held out a hand. Pay up, ladies. Ria and Aika rolled their eyes, but produced their purses from out of thin air. What? Issei asked in a flat tone. I'd bet them that you'd want to talk about this today, as early as possible, Tsubasa replied with a gentle smile. After the last week, I figured you wouldn't want to waste time. I was half expecting last night, Aika admitted. The way you kept looking at us, Ikun. Her ever-present smirk was gentler than usual. I'm not sure our dresses would have survived any intense discussions. Hey, now, Issei started to protest, but Tsubasa held up a hand. Her smile was somewhere between Ria's gentle grin and Aika's smirk, and her cheeks were unusually pink. Relax, Ice-chan. We know you'd never hurt anyone, given the choice. Especially not the girls you like. Issei winced as she said the words. Exactly how transparent am I? He finally asked, trying to keep resigned exasperation out of his voice. He wasn't successful. Lass, Aika said, her smirk softening. But that's one of the things we like about you. Aichu talked to Ria and I the day after you signed the Thursday night contract, Tsubasa explained. She idly twirled a cheese fork between her fingers. That was three months ago, Issei murmured, not sure how he felt about that. She figured that if anyone in her peerage was going to develop feelings for you, and vice versa, it'd be us. Tsubasa's smile was slightly sardonic, but he could see the affection behind it. He wondered if he'd just been afraid to admit he saw it before. We know better than to bet against her. She talked to Kaori and I the Sunday after we joined up, Aika added. Like Tsubasa-chan said, Kaichu's good at figuring the odds. She raised an eyebrow as she gazed at Issei. Maybe now you'll actually tell us what we smell like to you. Iruk took a deep breath before speaking. The sense of the five young women before him seemed to start blending. Not a harmonious whole, not yet, but the potential for that hung in the air before him. He looked at Aika first. Peppermint ice cream and cold milk, in the process of being mixed into a milkshake. His eyes shifted to Tsubasa next. Freshly picked strawberries in the summer sun. Finally, his eyes found Ria's, and he was surprised to see her smile seem a little tremulous. Baked apples and cinnamon. The three of you your scents are stronger than anyone besides Sona-chan and Kaori. Say it, Ice-chan, Tsubasa insisted gently. You know what it means. Issei forced his shoulders to relax. I think no, I know I like you three. Romantically, sexually I won't say I love you yet, but I'm headed that direction. He was pushing out the words before his sense of self-preservation could stop him. You know what Sona-chan said are the requirements for me having a harem. I want to apply them to you three, if you're interested. When we're all ready he managed a self-mocking laugh. And if you're not, please just pretend we never had this conversation he felt Sona squeeze his right hand, and Kaori did the same with his left after a moment. There was a long contemplative silence. Tsubasa was the one to finally break it after taking a sip of lemonade. Can we ease into this? I don't think I'm ready to pull a Kaori. That had better not become a thing, Kaori half grumbled as a laugh rippled around the table. Despite that, the comment did seem to break some of the tension. Issei smiled gently. Sure. Like I told Kaori, we can move as fast or as slow as you're comfortable with. If you need some time to think it over, that's fine. Ria and I have had months, Tsubasa said, shaking her head. There might have been hints of trepidation in her expression, but not trace one of doubt. I can't speak for her, but I know what I want. Ria beeped her head, looking pensive, and nodded in agreement. Honestly, if Kaichu hadn't been interested, we'd probably have proposed something like this to you. Are you serious? Issei knew his expression was one of dull-witted shock, but he couldn't help it. As they nodded, he slumped his shoulders in relief and shifted his gaze towards Aika. Aika-san. I think I will need to think about this, she said thoughtfully. She was silent for a moment, then her smirk returned. Nope, I'm sure. She took her glasses off for a moment, using her t-shirt to clean them, and looked him in the eye. Issei didn't think he'd ever fully appreciated how warm they could be. I'm in. Oh. Oh. Well good. That had to be the lamest thing he'd ever said, Issei thought, and the sudden wave of amusement he sensed rippling around the table seemed to confirm it. But what he'd just learned more than outweighed the minor embarrassment. Ria's smile mirrored his, and she leaned forward, popping a grape into her mouth. The action was strangely mesmerizing, and the edge of mischief that slipped into her eyes told Issei that she hadn't missed his reaction. When the time comes, Ikun, I want a fancy proposal. Dinner and dancing, a night out on the town to celebrate. Aika nodded, her smirk softening. Don't forget making out under the moonlight. That's key. Tsubasa made a face. That kind of thing isn't my style. Out in nature, or on the beach, or something like that now you're talking. She abruptly leaned across the table and kissed him firmly. She didn't taste like strawberries, not exactly, Issei mused. Well, the part of him that could think clearly, anyway. 
Her kiss tasted like her, but somehow with undertones of sun-kissed berries. It was just like how Kaori's scent translated to her taste. He wanted more. When she finally drew back, both of them were red-faced and breathing raggedly. Tsubasa spoke first, her tone speculative. I don't know if I'm ready to call you my fiancé yet, though. Especially not until we figure out how to deal with this at school. I think I'd rather just be your girlfriend for a while. She smiled slightly. Just for a while, though. Your endgame I want that too. Ahem. My turn, Ria said brightly, standing and rounding the table herself. Once Tsubasa had pulled back, she kissed Issei aggressively, half straddling him for a brief delicious moment. Once again, baked apples and cinnamon were underlying her natural flavor, and he felt almost drunk. When their lips finally parted, she murmured against his mouth, yes. I feel the same way. But I'm like Tsubasa I don't want to skip right to fiancé. I'll be your girlfriend for now. She looked at Kaori and Sona, and Aika and Tsubasa. All of yours, too. She grinned. When in the underworld, Aika said blithely, but there was a kind of nervous anticipation to her body language. She stood, rounding the table, and gently nudged Ria out of the way so she could kiss Issei. Like the other girls, her kiss had undertones of the flavor associated with her scent, rather than tasting exactly like it. When she broke the kiss, she looked more demure than he'd ever seen her. It was enchanting. That's a yes, by the way, she murmured. To being one of your girlfriends. I'm good with the engagement coming later. We've created a monster, Kaori stage whispered to Sona. She sounded more amused than anything else, and Sona replied with a chuckle, indicating that she felt the same. We'd better work out a schedule, then, Kaori said, smiling. She turned Issei's head just enough so that she could kiss him as well. Yes. Once we get back to Kuo, we should, Sona agreed. She took his right hand in both her hands, as if to subtly enforce her dominant position in the oh, god. I really do have a harem now, Issei thought. He still felt a little drunk. Tsubasa looked thoughtful. I kind of like that. We all know where we want this to go, after all. No need to push too hard right now, is there? Not when we're on the same page. She chuckled. Girlfriends and fiancés, Ice-chan. You really are a rapacious dragon, aren't you? Her smile was teasing, with just a hint of lasciviousness. We need a bigger bench, though, Ria piped up. Or to teach Akun some duplication magic. Why do you think I want to hurry him to middle class? Sona said, and a soft, sweet laugh rippled around the veranda. Now Issei felt their respective scents starting to integrate with each other, growing slowly but surely into a harmonious whole. At the same time, he still had that vague feeling that there were scents missing he couldn't imagine what they were, though. That was something for another day, though. He couldn't imagine wanting more than what than who he was looking at right now. You can't be serious, Issei said an hour later. He stared exasperatedly at the massive projection screen. Yes, I am. Serzichas seemed highly amused as he fiddled with the remote. He, Grafia and Serafal had asked Sona and Rhea's peerages to meet them in the Gremory Estates Theatre. The room was cozier than a normal cinema would be, with angled rows of long plush couches, instead of the normal bucket seats. You guys are famous right now. He pointed at the screen, and Issei found himself watching the final fight against Riser. It was very strange to see himself on the huge screen, particularly when he went full on Dragon. Something seemed off, though, and he realized that there was music playing. He definitely didn't remember music during the fight wait. He groaned and fascipumed as he recognized the orchestral piece. He and Sona had watched that movie again recently. Sona's eyebrows shot upward. She clearly recognized it too. I'll admit that the Attack of the Clone soundtrack is a good choice she managed, her tone judicious. We need to get you a lightsaber, Ikun, Ria said brightly. Right. Serafal agreed. She looked highly amused. Show them the others. There are more? Kaori asked dubiously. Serafal nodded enthusiastically. Not only that, everyone who actually took down Riser has gotten a nickname. The Undernet doesn't waste time. She smiled wryly. I'm not sure you understand just how many people Riser Phoenix has rubbed the wrong way. Seeing him get tossed around like a rag doll made a lot of folks happy. Nicknames, Issei repeated, looking like he was about to cringe. Yep. Serafal pointed at Akeno. Akeno-chan, you're being called the Phoenix Blaster because of all the holy lightning you threw at him. Her finger shifted to Saji. Sakun, you and Asia-chan are the Phoenix Breakers because your sacred gear made it possible to actually hurt him and her magic kept you shielded while you were doing that. That finger of hers now pointed at Kaori. Kaori-chan is the Phoenix Cutter for obvious reasons. She finally turned towards Issei, and her mischievous smile was almost blinding. And Ikken and Kaneko-chan are the Phoenix Busters because of how you two kicked his ass in close combat. Particularly you, Ikken, with that draconic beatdown you gave him. That's actually a lot better than I expected, Issei admitted. It's also marketable, Serafal pointed out. I'll be sitting down with some people to discuss it next week. 
This is a good way to start building a nest egg for your peerage. I guess I can't argue with that. Risers really hated that much, huh? His personality isn't such that endears itself to other people, Grafia interjected mildly. That footage of you forcing him to resign has already gained you some popularity. Serzich has pulled the next video up on DeviTube. This one was the final fight against Riser again, but it had been ridiculously sped up and set to a zany-sounding instrumental track. It sounded vaguely familiar, but Issei couldn't place it. Grafia wrinkled her nose. Really? The Benny Hill theme. Hey, don't blame me, I didn't do it. Serzich has protested, holding up both hands. All I did was find it. You're lucky I know you can't video edit worth a damn, Grafia remarked dryly, taking a sip from her teacup. Oh, this one is my favorite. Serzich has clicked on the DeviTube clip. It was taken from a semi-obscure American action comedy about disavowed special forces troops out for revenge. In the scene, the team hacker was holding finger guns on a security guard, threatening him with apparent telekinesis, which was actually his sniper comrade in a nearby building. Instead of the actual dialogue, Issei heard his own voice shouting resign now, damn it, or I'll make a pincushion out of your nads. The journey song from the original scene was still there, though, so that was nice. Oh my god Issei groaned, facipaming. Sona patted his back, but her neutral demeanor was showing cracks, and amused approval was clearly present. The rest of her peerage was showing the same reaction, to varying degrees. I rather like the one with the clip from A Few Good Men, Grafia said thoughtfully. Issei just groaned again. Tsubasa patted Issei on the shoulder. See, Ice-chan. You're famous already. His family is gonna want my head on a pike, Issei mumbled. They can want it all they like, Sona said flatly. They won't get it. Kaori nodded firmly, resting one hand on Yuzorajiri's hilt. Ah, yes, funny thing, Serzich's piped up. The House of Phoenix will actually not be seeking retribution. Both Lady Phoenix and Ravel-chan were insistent. What? It's actually thanks to Asia-chan and to what Issei Kun said about it, Serzich has explained. All I did was mouth off about how I was protecting my sister and how any big brother worth a damn would do the same thing, Issei said, his cheeks heating. I remember. I was there. And that is exactly what Ravel said when defending you, Serzich has replied triumphantly. And her mother agreed and when Lady Phoenix makes up her mind, Lord Phoenix is smart enough not to fight against the tide. Riser's brothers aren't exactly thrilled with the reasoning, but they're not really resisting it. He eyed the younger devil appraisingly. I think you made quite an impression on her. That's got to be an exaggeration, Issei muttered. He wasn't sure how he felt about that or the looks that his girlfriends exchanged. He still couldn't quite believe he had a harem now. Then there's the little matter of his intention to renege on the deal he made with Sotan, Serafal added. That's been leaked, and I'm pretty sure it was Ravel-chan who leaked it. The House of Phoenix is doing their best to make sure all the egg ends up on Riser's face. Which is where it belongs, really. Issei's future sister-in-law was just as pissed off about what Riser had actually had planned for Issei as Sona was. I don't suppose I can sue the House of Phoenix for damages, then Issei asked, jokingly. Instead of chuckles, Serzich's and Serafal and, ominously, Sona exchanged looks. Finally, Sona said thoughtfully, it's possible something could be arranged. Alarm bells went off in Issei's head. Ah, never mind, it sounds like that could be a hassle, he said quickly. No, I think Ravel-chan might be easy to persuade, Serafal said, her tone matching Sona's. Okay, I don't think I like where this is going, Issei said, raising his voice slightly. Let's just leave it for now. Actually, that brings me to the actual reason for this conversation, Serzich has said with a grin. I owe all of you for freeing my sister from that engagement. Especially the three of you who fought with her peerage in the match. I don't have any doubt that she would have been miserable. He sighed, his expression growing solemn. I really should have taken a more proactive role in pulling her out. Grafia's expression softened fractionally, and she squeezed her husband's hand. You were just as trapped in your role as Riyasama was. If anyone was to blame well, it wasn't you. Riyas nodded. Like I told you, Ani-sama, I never held you responsible. Be that as it may, I owe your friends, Serzich has told her, his expression serious. If it wouldn't set the pillars aflame with outrage, I'd bump the three of you to middle class right now. We understand, Serzich-sama, Kaori said politely, and Issei nodded in agreement. I get why you can't, the rook mused. The Mayor limited in how much pull they can use in situations like this, particularly regarding their families. You're exactly right. Serzich has nodded approvingly at Issei. But there are things I can grant you, nonetheless. First, I'll arrange for your performances in the match to be counted as a passing grade for the combat portion of the middle class testing. When the time comes for you to take the tests and I have a feeling that it'll be sooner rather than later you'll have one third of it already done. Issei blinked, a surprised smile appearing on his face. He looked at Sona and she nodded, also looking pleased. 
Apparently, this was as good as it sounded. That's great. Serzichas smiled again. Second Sona, what you asked for before. You have it now. And not just for a Seikun. That smile of his turned almost impish. This is probably pushing the limits of acceptable nepotism, but it's accepted that upper-class devils act as patron to the peerages of their family and friends. Tsona brightened even more. Thank you Sir Zitsama. That's quite gracious of you. Issei had to agree. This all but assured that he would make middle class in the no-too-distant future. He wasn't as convinced about a rapid ascent to high class, but Sona seemed to believe it, and she had the better judgment in this case. He really was on the fast track, now. And so was the rest of the peerage, which made it even better. To have his girls my girls, he thought giddily on the same level with him. Serzichas nodded. This is a case where all of us will benefit from the arrangement. He shook his head, his smile becoming slightly wistful. I just wish we could solve the problem of Rhea's future suitors as easily. That's easy. All eyes shifted to Sir Afal, and the Leviathan grinned impishly. Tell everyone that Rhea Tan's fallen for Ikin. Issei's eyes bugged out, and he stared, slack-jawed at her. He could feel Kaori's surprise, and that of the rest of his peerage mates. Sarani. He blurted out in protest. That's insane. That'll never. He trailed off as Sona and Rhea's expression sank in. Neither of them looked surprised, or particularly displeased, by the suggestion. What are you two up to? He asked slowly. We'd already reached that conclusion last night, Issei Kuhn, Sona told him, reaching for his left hand. The best way to keep Rhea's would-be husbands at bay is to let it slip that she's in love with someone already. Me? He said flatly. No one who knows us will buy that. Senpai's like a big sister to me. That's not necessarily a deal-breaker in devil society, Rhea's commented dryly. But I feel the same way about you. Her smile was slightly tart, matching her tone. And this is temporary, right? Kaori asked warily. You're not going to change your mind and actually fall for him. Her tone clearly said you had better not, and the sudden tension rising through his other lovers suggested that they shared the sentiment. She seemed to be settling into the idea of being one of his fiancés very easily, Issei thought. No, she won't, Sona answered firmly. We discussed that at length. Rhea shrugged. I trust Haidu Kun. But that kind of love. I don't feel any such spark, and I know he doesn't. Her tart smile shifted to a smirk. After all, I'm not his type. That is going to end up quoted on my grave, Issei muttered as a chuckle rippled around the room. The point is that doing this will keep those idiots at bay, until I can find a fiancé who I actually get along with, Rias continued. Or find some other solution. She sobered slightly. Hi Du Kun, I know I've already asked a lot of you, and you've already delivered. But this would help a lot. Issei's expression clearly said I actually have a choice in the matter. After a moment though, he let out a heavy sigh. Sona Chan, there's no other way. Short of shooting every other pillar family male of our age group in the head, no, Sona said flatly. And no, that's not an option, I'm afraid, she sighed, as Issei opened his mouth to agree. I promise, Anata, this arrangement will end the moment there's a real solution. And Riaz has agreed not to interfere in in our family's affairs. She said the last part slowly, as if the knowledge that he that they really had a harem was only now sinking in. This knowledge will be for underworld circulation only. It should have no spillover into the school. Issei glanced around at his other lovers, gauging their reactions. None of them seemed particularly thrilled about it. Kaori, especially, looked like she was considering telling Riaz that she could solve her own damned problems. Issei could relate. But each of them seemed to accept the necessity, or were at least resigned to it. He squared his shoulders and nodded. All right. Under the circumstances, I can accept this. It really is a pity that Serzichas started to say. No. No, it isn't, Issei, Sona, and Ria said in unison. Sona straightened Issei's shirt, buttoning it all the way up, and knotted the string tie neatly. It was really weird to actually wear the uniform neatly, but the way her eyes lit up as she looked at him made it worthwhile. His uniform blazer was still around her shoulders, though, and she showed no sign of removing it. She gave his shirt a last firm tug, and eyed him approvingly. Almost perfect. What am I missing? Issei asked curiously. You're dressed, Sona replied, the corners of her mouth turning upwards. Issei burst out in pleased laughter. No one at school would believe that Shatori Sauna was capable of even the most indirect bodiness, but he knew better. So are you, he replied with a grin of his own. Let's fix that. Tonight, she promised. I'm sure Kaori and the others would be less than thrilled if we were late. Yeah, you're right, he agreed. The thought of seeing Kaori again, and the others, wafted through his mind like a soothing, sweet-smelling breeze. It brought with it the memory of waking up with Kaori curled up on his left side, half-naked and clutching him like a body pillow. She'd had to hurry and teleport home before her parents found out she wasn't there. You two seem to be in a hurry, Rio noted cheerily as they came down the stairs. 
She offered them both handkerchief wrapped pack a gaze. A light breakfast for your walk. Thanks, Kasan, Issei told her gratefully. He and Sona made their goodbyes and left the house. Kaori waited outside the gate for them, brightening as she saw them. Morning, she said brightly. Hi there, Issei said in return, his grin widening. Good morning, Kaori, Sona replied, looking serenely satisfied. Kadisan isn't with you. I told her I'd meet her at school. She's asking about how things went with the boy I said I liked. She bit her lip thoughtfully. Explaining this will be interesting. You can blame everything on me, if you want, Issei offered as they walked. He unwrapped the small pack of Gario had given him, breaking off a chunk of toast, and offered it to Kaori. Kaori shook her head. It's nice of you to offer, but that would just make things worse. Sona-san, maybe we need to have another meeting with her. Probably. Sona was doing likewise, although she nibbled rather than devouring at Issei's frantic pace. Dinner someplace, then. Something that will help create a relaxed atmosphere. She smiled as a fourth person joined them. Good morning Tsubasa. Morning. Tsubasa sketched a mock salute to her fiancé and co-fiancés. You look pensive, Kaori. Just trying to figure out how to sell my best friend on ice, the knight said. She's finally convinced he's not gonna regress to perverted dual levels, but this might set her back. Issei opened his mouth, and she shook her head firmly. Nah. I don't regret this. You're stuck with me, hi do Issei. I don't think he ever doubted that, Sona noted, squeezing Issei's hand. He squeezed back. Well, I want to make sure he doesn't, Kaori replied. She squeezed his other hand. Now if only Ice-chan had a third hand, Tsubasa joked. Kaori slid her hands up his arm. There you go. That's much better. Tsubasa took hold of his now free hand. Won't this make walking awkward? Issei asked. Indeed, he was having to concentrate in order not to stumble, although that might have more to do with being pawed at by three beautiful girls. So? The three girls said in unison, their tones blithe. After a moment, the four of them burst out laughing. Looks like there's a story there, Aika commented. She and Ria fell into step with Issei and the others, and something inside him relaxed as their scents mingled. This felt this smelled like home. Loud, he said, Basa chan's complaining that I only have two arms. It's not like I'm a Hindu god or something. It's just as well, Sona noted. It's not outside the realm of possibility that you'll meet some of the diva. It's weird to think about us moving in those kinds of circles, Kaori said softly. Aika, Ria, I think parts of his shoulders are free. At this rate, you five will have to carry me, Issei joked. I'll wait till I can get him alone later, Ria replied with a smirk, then shook her head. I don't like that we can't be open about this at school. It can't be helped. Aika didn't look particularly pleased about it either, and she did wrap her arm around Issei's other bicep. The coon's rep is only now starting to get better, and there are too many people still willing to think the worst of him. Not to mention those two idiots. She blew out an irritated breath. We should enjoy this when we can. We still have the council office and the programming club, Aika-san, Issei reminded her in a reassuring tone. Don't sand me anymore, she said. Her cheeks were unusually pink, her tone more subdued than normal, and it was rather becoming. Just Aika. A look passed between her and Kaori, and it was a rarity to see the good-natured smirk on Kaori's face, while Aika wore a slightly abashed look. Aika. Issei smiled at her, and she returned it. Welp, there's the gate. He looked up at Tsubasa's words, and indeed the academy gate loomed ahead. It was surprisingly quiet, even deserted, for this time of morning. Tsubasa let out an irritated breath of her own and let go of his arm. Aika's lips compressed into a thin line, and after a moment, she did likewise. Kaori's hand lingered in Issei's until other students came into view, and she let go with a slightly petulant sigh. As Issei-kun said, we still have the council office and outside school. Sona's tone was gentle and reassuring. And my home. We have plenty of places to be us. She managed to pack a world's worth of meaning into that single world, and Issei felt himself heartened by it. He could tell, from the body language of his other lovers, that they felt the same. Yeah, he agreed. He caught their eyes in turn, soaking in their faces. Sona wore a reassuring smile. Kaori did as well, but hers was subtler, more laced with wryness. Tsubasa's face wore a ready-to-take-on-the-world grin, as if she savored the idea of facing the challenges ahead. Aika smirked knowingly. Ria smiled slowly, her eyes sparkling with mischief. For a moment, he inhaled, the combined scent of his loves relaxing and invigorating him. How could they fail at anything if they were together? Shall we? He said, nodding at the gate. Sona nodded. Let's go. Lead the way, Ice, Kaori said, gesturing. Because rooks are supposed to tank, Aika added with a chuckle. Tank, hell. I'll push you out first tomorrow, Aika, Tsubasa Mok threatened, her eyes twinkling. Yes. Ria dimpled. We're with you, Akun. 
You don't know how glad I am for that, Issei said sincerely. As six of them stepped through the campus gate, their heads held high. End of the year. So that's it for today's video guys, before you go just like the video and share it with your friends. Bye.